Good evening. Thank you all for being here on such a lovely evening. I hope you got a chance to enjoy the garden as you came in and saw the exhibits that were here. But um, my name is Patty Arnold. I'm the senior vice president in charge of institutional advancement here at the garden. I think I've, I've met most of you over the years. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening, and we really appreciate your support as garden members. This is really kind of a, a fun night because we don't get to uh, have a panel discussion very often with a lot of our scientists, so <clears throat> I know we're really in for a treat. But this, this evening, our member speaker series will take a special look at the garden's global horticulture, science, and conservation efforts. Our plant conservation, exploration, and restoration activities take place in more than 50 countries around the world. Tonight, three members of the Garden Science and Conservation team will share how they prepare for and conduct field work in Asia, Latin America, Africa, and Madagascar. We'll let each of the speakers introduce themselves and, they, and, and their particular areas of expertise as part of tonight's panel, and then address questions from, um, from our moderator. In addition to our prepared questions, we will have time for audience questions and answers at the end of the panel discussion. So please hold your questions until that time. But now I'd like to introduce Kate Grumke, who is our moderator for tonight's program. Kate is a senior environmental reporter at St. Louis Public Radio and Harvest Public Media. She grew up in St. Louis and graduated from the University of Missouri School of Journalism. And she's a pretty impressive young woman. Um, before moving back home uh, to work at St. Louis Public Radio, Kate spent almost six years producing television in Washington, D.C., most recently for PBS NewsHour. Kate has won a Peabody and a National Murrow Award and was nominated for a National Emmy Award. Her work also appears on NPR national broadcasts. Pretty impressive, I'd say. So we're delighted to have Kate with us today. So I'm going to turn this over to Kate. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. This is really exciting, and we're going to learn all about the research that the people here do. And so we're going to start with some short presentations. And so first, we're going to introduce Monica Carlson, who is the Assistant Scientist and Education Coordinator for the Latin America Department. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Kay said, I am in the Latin American department, I'm one of the scientists in the department, and I also have the privilege of running the education program for the Science and Conservation Division. So a lot of people, the first question that they ask me when they meet me is, where are you from? You have an accent. Uh, my, my answer is really simple. I am tropical. So this is my hometown, Caracas, Venezuela. I grew up there. I went to the university as an undergraduate there, and I love mountains. I got in love with plants and with mountains just because I had a mountain right behind my door, right? So I started in a climbing club when I was in Venezuela, and I just got hooked on going into the field. I don't mind that it's hard. I don't mind that you get wet all the time. I don't mind the mud. I just love it. Venezuela is also really uh, notorious for having the longest waterfall in the world. So it's about a little bit more than half a mile long, and it's called the Angels Fall. The Missouri Botanical Garden recognized that this area of Venezuela, the Venezuelan Guiana, where the tabletop mountains are, is full of diversity of plants. And they actually had a field program in the 90s in there that collected tons of specimens in Venezuela. And they came out with the flora of the Venezuelan Guiana. You can actually see one example of the book that we produce here at the garden there. So obviously, the connection between Venezuela and the garden was very strong. 
it got even stronger for me when I became an intern at the Herbarium and the Botanical Garden in Caracas. I started seeing the names of curators and staff here at the garden. Oh, this person works at the Missouri Botanical Garden. I knew everybody just by looking at the specimens that they had collected from Venezuela while they were in their field trips. So it was really easy for me to figure out where do you want to go to do your graduate school? The US. Two reasons. So the number one export in terms of plants for Hawaii are these plants, the Anturians. Okay? So these are the plants that I started to study as an undergraduate in Venezuela. And then I discovered, wow, the US has tons of commercial varieties of these plants. So it would be really nice if I can go to the US and study them. Where in the US? In Hawaii? Well, they, they breed the commercial varieties, but I want to work with the wild relatives. So here we are at the Missouri Botanical Garden. The greenhouse house about 3,000 different specimens of this family in three greenhouse complex that are only open to researchers. So members get a special treats when we do tours of the Aeroid greenhouses. We do them once in a while. I do them once in a while. Send me an email, you get a special treat of the Aeroid greenhouses. And we're featured in tons of YouTube videos just like this one that you see here. They feature our research, they feature our collection, our group of botanists that goes in the field hunting for these plants. The next type of research that I do, besides going in the field, is smelling. So this family of plants is notorious for, let me see if I can advance, they are stinky things, right? Were you able to be here on Monday evening when the coarse flower opened? Raise your hand, I was. There you go, my students were here, yes. <laughs> so it just opened. So if you have never experienced it, you have to come to the botanical garden when it opens. It's stinky, I will not describe it for you. You have to feel it, okay? So in general, the research that we have done with the smells is the stinky plants, but we have not done the research with the sweet smelly plants, the ones that smell like fruits and flowers. Those are the ones that I concentrate on. So my research takes me all over the world where these plants grow, including Hawaii. They are not native to Hawaii, but they grow in Hawaii. And I study the new species, I study their smells, I study how they are related to each other. But obviously I'm only part of the Latin American department. So Latin American countries, we have 33 different countries in Latin America, all the way from Mexico down to Argentina. We as the garden team of explorers, we have been to every single one of these countries. We currently have in-house programs in two of them, in Peru and Bolivia. And you will see a lot of pictures from the field from those uh, adventures, as well as my adventures in 10 different botanic, in 10 different countries in Latin America. The other thing that to me makes it come full circle is that I am the educator coordinator of the science division. I was an intern at one point in time. Now I'm going full circle and being the mentor for the interns. So I'm training the next generation of botanists right here in St. Louis at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And a few of them are right there in the audience. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Robbie Hart, who is the director of the William L. Brown Center. Hi, everyone. That's a hard act to follow, so I'm going to be pretty quick. But um, So I direct the William L. Brown Center here at Missouri Botanical Garden. This is our center that's focused on plants and people. Um, so we think hard about uh, food plants, uh, plants used for medicine, plants of cultural value, aesthetic value, religious value, plants people use to build things with, make paper with. Um, and we approach this from a lot of different directions, uh, from crops and crop domestication and crop improvement, um, from uh, plant natural products and the way that plants can be economically important to people, to uh, community-based conservation, where we try to integrate people's livelihoods uh, um, with in biodiversity conservation around them. 
to what I'm focused on myself and what I'm going to talk about tonight, which is the impacts of climate change uh, on plants, specifically high mountain plants, and uh, how that affects the ways that people use mountain plants. So uh, like Monica, I grew up um, in, in mountains and uh, developed my love for mountains uh, there in the Olympic Mountains in Washington State. This is actually a recent picture uh, of my wife, Elsa, who's here today, uh, um, uh, and me doing some field work in the Olympics just this last year. But it was where I was born and raised. Um, and uh, my first significant travel anywhere in the world, except for Canada, was, um, was to Nepal, to some other mountains. Um, so this is where I did uh, field work as an undergraduate. I was actually doing linguistics field work, so studying language diversity and cultural diversity. But when I was in Nepal, I um, both fell in love with their mountains as well, but also really was introduced to this idea that people who tended to still speak these small local languages, to still practice traditional customs um, and ways of living on the land and in the land, were also people who knew about the plants, knew about the land. And so biodiversity conservation, cultural conservation, or cultural survival really go hand in hand. And I got really fascinated by this idea. Um, speeding forward to a time when I wanted to come back to school and start a doctoral program, um, I found the perfect mentor for this in Jan Salek and the perfect institution here at the Missouri Botanical Garden working with University of Missouri St. Louis where I, I got my dissertation, my PhD. Um, so uh, I was doing this under Jan's supervision uh, in the Hangduan Mountains in China, um, the sort of third mountains I'll talk to you about which I consider part of the broader Himalayan region. They're in southwest China, close to ethnically Tibetan areas, and at the far eastern edges of what you might think of as the greater Himalayan area. Um, so uh, here I was looking at um, how we can track climate change impacts on one particularly important group of plants, the rhododendrons, um, at the center of their diversity. So this is where uh, rhododendron um, diversity that you see here in gardens, most of it originated there, and the parents of many of the hybrids that you see planted around here um, come from the Hangduan Mountains. Um, and I was trying to look at how we can elucidate climate change impacts um, both from traditional ecological methods, hiking up and down mountains, taking data on field books, but also from talking to local people about what they've seen in their lifetimes, and also what they've culturally accreted across generations in stories and songs and traditional knowledge. Um, so I'm really lucky now to get to, as well as directing the William L. Brown Center, to manage a, a, a large climate change research uh, project here at Missouri Botanical Garden, where we manage permanent plots across the eastern Himalayas. And so I've got to revisit these beloved places in Nepal and in China and in Bhutan, which is a new country for me, which is a small Himalayan kingdom that falls between Nepal and China. Um, to look at the long-term effects of how climate change is impacting these plants in high mountains, um, in places that are usually dominated by cold temperatures and are getting rapidly warmer as climate change affects them. Um, most recently, the work that Elsa and I were doing in the Olympic Mountains in Washington was to set up a paired site uh, also using these same methods that we use in Nepal, Bhutan, and China in the Olympic Mountains in Washington. So. Um, a lot of the pictures you'll see rotating through and the answers that I'm going to give you to sort of demonstrate some of our work, just, just my facet of our work in Asia um, as the sort of Asia representative uh, of this panel, um, are going to be drawn from this, this plot network in Nepal, Bhutan, and China. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce you to Nisa K. Rimi, who is an assistant scientist with the Africa and Madagascar program. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, so yes, my name is Nisa Kirimi. I'm an assistant scientist in the Africa Madagascar program. I've been here at the garden for about a year now, just over a year. Um, and I was told to give like a two minute background on how I, my, my path to the garden. 
Um, and I found that hard to do because I have a rather long and meandering pathway um, <laughs> till I found my way here. So my prior um, academic and professional background, I've just highlighted here on this slide um, with a number of the organizations that I have had the pleasure to work with over the past couple decades. Um, so the, the common theme is that I've, I had worked in land management um, in both public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Um, and all of these organizations and the work with these organizations always included some component of working in the field. Um, I have a sheer love for exploration um, and a desire to experience the world's incredible biodiversity. Um, and so my experiences both with these organizations and just for my own um, desire, I have traveled um, all over the world in search of botanical adventures. Um, and after um, um, sort of coming to realization that then I wanted to, to, to go back to school to receive um, a doctorate degree for, for studying um, plant biodiversity. Um, and so that led me to the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I pursued my doctorate degree. Um, I studied the evolutionary history of the baobab trees of Africa and Madagascar. And so a lot of the images you'll see tonight is my fieldwork um, that I have conducted in Tanzania, South Africa, and all across Madagascar. Um, so my work has included trying to understand what constitutes a species um, there's currently six species of baobab described in Madagascar. It might actually be better to classify them as eight different species. Um, what pollinates these trees? How are they related to each other? So what sort of dynamics do they have with pollinators on the landscape? So a lot of the images you'll see tonight um, has to do with those questions. And so my research really sits at this interface of ecology, evolution, and conservation. Because um, if you're not familiar, the baobab trees have a really strong connection with people all across their range. Um, and so that brings me to ending up here um, in St. Louis in the Science and Conservation Division in our Africa Madagascar um, department. Um, so our program, if you're not familiar, um, works all across continental Africa and Madagascar. The main countries where we have programs are highlighted on this map here. Um, we've had a sustained presence in Madagascar for, for about 30 years now. We have four staff based here in St. Louis. We have four staff based in Europe um, and another two permanent staff based in Madagascar. But we also have hundreds of permanent staff that are exclusively funded through um, grants and, and, and projects. Um, and so our work really touches on all four of these themes that I'm showing you on this slide here. So we really work on botanical um, discovery, in situ and ex situ conservation projects. Um, MBG owns and manages 12 conservation sites in Madagascar where we engage local communities in conservation programs. Um, and so you'll be hearing about some of these projects tonight. Um, so thank you for coming. <laughs> So first question for you all, I'd love to hear how you end up on a trip. How do you start the planning process and what do you do to get this together? <laughs> okay, I'll take, I'll take it. <laughs> so um, it takes a lot of time to plan a trip. Can you, can you all hear me? I don't know if you can. Yeah, okay. Nice and close. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it takes a lot of planning. So the first thing that I usually do is I go into the herbarium. So if you saw the, all the herbarium specimens that were on the tables, I, I go there and I try to find where are the places that I would like to go. Places that have interesting plants that I want to see again, that I want to collect again, or places that nobody else has been to for 20 or 40 years. Is there a forest still left that I can get some plants and I can get some samples for? So that's where my research starts in the herbarium, looking for places to go. And after that, it starts the permits. Like, so we had to get permits to go to all these places. So contact the local governments, contact the communities, contact our collaborators, other students that have been there before, other staff that have been there before, so we can get us feeling for what we need in order to prepare for this trip. So the first 
couple of months is doing all this research until you actually get to make it, so until you got the permission to go to the field. So it's a lot of like detective work, I will call it. <laughs> I guess I'll just add to that. Um, a lot of my work involves working with a lot of different organizations and researchers in other countries. And the process of sort of initiating partnership with people that you've maybe never worked with before or trying to understand what projects they're working on that may be compatible with yours but aren't necessarily published in US scientific journals. Um, so that process, I would say, also takes a significant amount of time um, to navigate before you start preparing for field work. And permits, I would say, is also <laughs> it takes at least a year to prepare for that. Um, in terms of packing, you know, that's um, one thing that I always just have a specific checklist for, and I think probably all of us do too. So, um, yeah. And Robbie, what about putting together an itinerary? How do you make sure that your schedule is going to get everything done that you need to get done? You leave a lot of room for contingency. Um, so. Um, I my last trip in 2022 was um, going back to Nepal and to Bhutan um, for the first time post pandemic. Um, in Bhutan, we um, were planning it when the country still had not yet reopened. Um, so we were in the position there uh, in sort of the like an extreme and cartoonishly uh, frightening version of what we always experience with uncertainty, but where we didn't even know if if we'd be led into the country of Bhutan. Um, we didn't have our visas yet, um, and so. Um, we were hiking up to a small hill from our camp in Nepal to try to call to Bhutan to see every morning, like, have the visas been issued yet? Have they been issued yet? Um, so that was one case where leaving lots of room for contingency really benefited us well. So Nisa, you mentioned packing. So tell us about all of the stuff that you have to bring and how do you make sure you have everything you need? Yeah, so I... Um, I'm obsessed with spreadsheets. So I actually have a spreadsheet with four different tabs on it. It's domestic field work, domestic field work with my child, international field work, international field work just for collecting, international field work for pollination studies. And so I have a running packing list that I always refer to. Um, and as soon as I know a trip's coming, I have my pile started, <laughs> so um, that's pretty essential. And Monica and I have, I think, had our fair share of having to change out equipment um, last minute and trying to find a way to make it, make it work. Um, I'm sure you have too, Robbie, but. <laughs> yeah, have any of you ever had something break or did you forget something? And when that happens, what do you have to do? <laughs> Yeah, I always forget something. I, I have the list, but I always forget something. So I, I don't know, my list needs a little bit of updating. Um, I'm breaking, yes. So I was actually uh, taking some, uh, it's a little liquid that you use to color flowers to figure out if they are reproductive or not at that stage. And I just put it in my luggage, like check luggage. I'm like, okay, it's packed in like a bubble wrap. It should be fine. Oh, it wasn't. I opened the, the suitcase and everything was blue. All my clothes, all the field equipment, blue. I'm like, okay, I'm wearing blue to the field this time. I couldn't do anything else. So I thought I packed really good, I, I didn't. So um, certain things you can replenish once you get to the country. There are other ones that, that you cannot. So you kind of have to improvise. I rely a lot in universities, in local universities. They usually have the same kind of equipment that I I need for my field trips. So I rely a lot on professors and students at those universities. Do I help, please? I don't know where to find this. And they are super, super helpful because they have been in the same shoes, no? They have lost something, forgot something. And we saw some of what you all use out on the tables and everyone will have a chance to see those again at the end of this, but could you tell us what those are? These are things that people probably aren't very familiar with if they're not scientists. Mm -hmm some of the material on the table. So um, I'm thinking about the, the pressing book that you use to make things for the herbarium, or you have a harness on that table. <laughs> so what are some of the, the regular tools that you need to make sure you have? So like the essential one for everybody that is collecting plants is a plant press. 
So as soon as you collect a sample of plants, you want to squish it as much as possible and get as much water out of it as possible. So for that, we use the plant press that was in one of the tables out, out there. I actually use myself as a weight when I'm pressing plants, so everything is really squished. And the pile can get super, super long. You can put like 200 different samples in there and just carrying them around. So that is like essential. If I, if I do not have that, then I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> so that is my essential. And the climbing harness. So since I was an undergraduate in Venezuela, I've always been studying plants that grow on trees. So I have to get to the top of the trees, to the canopies. <coughs> Sometimes people use like those spikes that grab the tree trunk, like um, you were saying your dad was a... Uh, My you grandpa, that? Your yeah. Your grandpa used that uh, when he was working as an, in the electrical in, company. Yeah, in the telephone so lines, yeah. To, to climb telephone poles, same concept with trees. I am not good at that. I can get like one, two feet up and immediately fall. My, my legs do not support that. So I actually went to training in California in the Sequoias National Forest with arborists that told me how to climb trees with jumars, which are like, uh, I don't know how to call those things, things that help you get up the, the ropes and the harness. So you can stand a lot of the, of, of the weight and don't use your legs. You're just basically sitting and hosting yourself up. And one thing that I told somebody that was at the table, we actually have here a class for um, children's and grown up, I've taken it, for the uh, education department where you can climb trees here at the garden. So if you want experience what is climbing a tree like an arborist, they do several classes. My husband and I have taken the class with a lot of 10 year olds and they're looking at us like, what are you doing here? <laughs> so I, I just love it, like, yeah. And Nisa have used those harnesses as well to, to study the pollination. There's probably some photos that you'll see of me in trees because those are some of my favorite. Um, in addition to the plant press, one thing in Madagascar we have to think about that goes in the plant press is newspaper. We often have to buy the newspaper in the capital city and carry it with us um, because you can't get newspaper in most of the communities. Um, and if you're planning on doing extensive collecting, you haul an extensive amount of newspaper um, to be able to swap, swap it out if it doesn't um, dry out fast enough. And so newspaper is something that seems to be something that you, it's essential and we often forget um, the importance of when we're collecting how much newspaper is actually needed. Um, also some of my studies, as Monica said, is pollination biology work. Um, and so some of that work requires capturing floral scent. Um, I have had a number of challenges with that, some of that equipment in the field where I've actually um, had to think about um, when I was a young child, my father taught me about circuits, electrical circuits, and how to build electrical circuits. And somehow, many decades later, I remembered that and I was able to get some wire and rewire some circuits to a, a new battery pack that I had extracted from a different device in order to get um, this, this pump to work. Um, so things, things do break and you have to improvise and it's amazing what you can <laughs> do on your own. So. And Ravi, could you start us off with talking about, um, so you've gone, you've got all these samples. What's it like traveling with plants out of the country? Sure. Well, one of the nice things about traveling with plants um, uh, country to country for us is that, um, as Monica and Nisa both mentioned, we always have the permits in advance. So, um, so often we don't have uh, much of a problem, um, except for you know explaining to uh, um, to various customs officials that in fact we we do have the right to be taking these plants uh, out of the country um, almost always. That uh, duplicates are deposited at a, a national herbarium in their country of origin, and that these are going to a scientific research institute where they're they're going to be consulted for scientific purposes by, by other scientists and build world knowledge about how to do things like combat food insecurity and fight climate change, um, not, not to go for some profit-making enterprise. Um, but there are still challenges always. Um, one of the things, in addition to um, pressed preserved plant specimens, which we collect to uh, study the shapes and sizes of and describe new species, um, we also often collect DNA material directly. Um, usually this is just a little bit of leaf material that we collect into a um, 
white powder called silica, which dries out the leaf material and does nothing else except keeps it nice and dry so we can do DNA work on it. But it can often be awkward to go up to customs, uh, say customs in China is where this happened to, to me, with a suitcase full of vials of little white uh, powder um, <laughs> and try to explain, well, actually, this is silica gel, don't worry. I'm a scientist, don't worry. So where do you all usually stay when you're doing this work and what's it like there? What are your accommodations like? I have, Devin, I have a, a photo somewhere called Accommodations, I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, in the Himalaya, often we're um, in, in the rain, in tents, in herders' huts. We're, we aren't actually in uh, um, cliffside uh, castles like this one, but, um, but we're close by, uh, just not in such nice accommodation. Um, often in, in the mud. Um, sometimes in cow pastures that we didn't know were cow pastures or yak pastures until the uh, 100 or 150 herd come home in the middle of the night. <laughs> if we're, I think if, um, if it's a, um, a, a good experience, we are very fortunate to be camping in some, some pretty stunning locations. Um, I would say that's, that's the best case scenario. Unfortunately, in some of the more um, impoverished nations like Madagascar, some of the accommodations have some pretty major sanitation issues. Um, and I won't go into detail t tonight on that, but there, there has been some, some challenges with accommodations, unfortunately. Maybe tell us what was one of the stunning ones that you remember most. One of the stunning ones. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some places in Madagascar that's called the Singi, which is the limestone um, outcroppings. I think there's some photos on, on the slide there. Um, and I would say being, being able to, to get permission to camp at those sites that are sometimes difficult to access um, was, was pretty amazing. Yeah, are these places that you wouldn't usually get the chance to camp in or stay overnight? So um, sometimes as a scientist, I think like we're definitely privileged to be in places that um, other people would not be, have been able to. Um, we definitely take that very seriously. Like there are places that we know we're super fortunate to be in with. And in terms of accommodation, like my, my preferred accommodation, and I have a slide somewhere around there, are hammocks. Like hammocks are just so easy to put everywhere. The one thing that you have to remember is mosquito netting. Uh, that goes all the way down to the ground. <laughs> I, I had that mistake once and I came back beaten by mosquitoes. Like my mosquito netting did not go all the way down to the ground. So after that experience, I, I make the extra long mosquito netting. But hammocks you can just put anywhere, no, and just, just good for the night. So I, I just love that. <laughs> and who are you usually collaborating with when you're there and what do the locals think of the work you're doing? I do a lot of work, um, especially in, in my work with baobabs, with um, the, the general population. Um, so I have a few slides, I think, of um, working with some of the children. Um, so when I do pollination work, I often have to sit in the tree canopy and observe sort of what's visiting, and I have cameras to document it. But oftentimes, if they're insects, or um, I think I have some slides of hawk moths, we actually need to capture them in order to be able to identify them to species. Because they move so quickly, um, you can't just photograph them in order to get them to species. So that is a task that the local um, children love to partake in. So I usually bring an extra headlamp. We wear red headlamps because it's less um, distracting. Um, and so then we are out there with, e they can do it by hand. I usually use a net. They can hand catch hawk moths from the trees. It's remarkable. Um, and so, so they love participating in that. Um, and and uh, a lot of the, the community members that utilize baobabs are interested in, in the research because it benefits um, their uses with, with these trees. So that's a big part of my work is working with the locals. Robbie, what about you? Who are you collaborating with on the ground? Sure, it's interesting for me because we actually use the exact same methods at every mountain summit we visit across the Himalaya, greater Himalayan region. Um, but we're always doing with different collaborators. So um, uh, we often have uh, national level um, botanical experts, people sort of who speak the same language we do, the same scientific language we do. But they can be from um, uh, governmental organizations, from universities, or from botanic gardens like ours. Uh, so um, on my next trip, we'll be working with a group from Shangri-La Botanical Gardens in China. Um, 
And, uh, but we're also working with uh, their students, graduate students, um, with local employees from um, groups of sort of concentric circles, smaller and smaller concentric circles of localness. Um, and then also when we finally get to our site with the local residents who are closest to the site. And the fun thing about our plot structure um, where we set it up and revisit it again and again every five to 10 years is that we get to know people and develop relationships with them. And they'll, even when scientists turn over, often the, um, the people who we're um, engaging with or hiring to help um, move equipment or to help do monitoring at the site um, actually have a, a, a sort of longer experience base than some of the scientists coming in to work on the site. Monica, what about you? So um, Robbie mentioned something important, like we get to know the people. I always joke with, with everybody that like we are supposed, like we as a human race, we are supposed to be like six degrees separation from each other. When we're talking about plan, it's like one degree. I know somebody that knows somebody that is going to be in that country that has done this work, that is a student, that is a previous garden collaborator, previous garden staff, current garden staff. We have this network of collaborators that we can engage in whenever we go into the field. And the students, they are just like magic. Like they want to help, they want to learn, they want to be with you. And something that I do when I work with local communities is I go around and I ask, who's the person that knows the most about plants here? Oh, it's such and such that live in that house over there. That's the person that, is, that I'm going to go with. And I attach to this person, like almost to, to, the, to the leg, you know? Like if wherever that person goes, I'm right behind it. And if my guy tells me, oh, you know what? We use this plant and we eat it like this and that. Show me. I'm going to eat it. So I also, I'm also kind of like a foodie. Everywhere I go, I want to try the local food. And I always rely on my local guys to figure out why can I eat in the forest. Like I have drink water from lianas and it's like the purest water that you can have. How do I do that? Because I pay attention to the guy and the guy said, you can use this one, don't use that one. And that's what we did. So like my network is just like getting to know people, getting to form those relationships of one degree separation between us. Let's talk about climate change. How is climate change affecting the work that you all are doing? I think, Devin, I think I have a photo or two actually labeled climate change in, in that folder. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm doing science that's focused on trying to figure out how climate change is affecting mountain plants. And hopefully, you know, eventually not just monitoring it, but also understanding if some plants are winning, um, how we use our knowledge about those plants to help us adapt to climate change better. And if some plants are losing, how we conserve them. Um, but. Um, you know, climate change, we can actually feel it affecting us in the field. Um, it's changing seasonality across the world. You know, we, we feel that. Um, uh, you, you've all felt that, changing seasons. Um, uh, but it's felt around the world as well. Um, so we were recently in, um, in Bhutan, as I mentioned, um, uh, caught in the rain, an unseasonally late rain, which was unpleasant, but also was a sign of climate change that local uh, residents were reporting to us as well when we did interviews. Here in Manang in Nepal, actually, um, so um, this is a video of, from the summit of one of our sites looking down at people working on the site. But below, you can see Manang town down in that river valley. And above it, on the left, that's a huge glacier coming down to a glacial lake that uh, is a glacial lake that forms and releases unexpectedly, um, threatens to release catastrophically. And that's one of, uh, one of many hazards sort of threatened by climate change to local people there. Um, in Madagascar, um, there's, uh, this, the western side of the island is extremely arid. And with climate change, we've seen a lot greater severity in droughts and wildfires. So I actually went back to a population once that was just totally eliminated um, due to uncontrolled wildfires. So we, are, we can observe it in, even in real time. And um, in my case, when I try to study pollination, I have to be there when the plant is flowering. Um, from the records, from the records that we have in the herbarium, is telling me that it's in May. And I go there in May, nothing is flowering. Like, okay, what happened? 
and is that is climate change. The plants are responding to the clues in the environment, and May is no longer the time that there is good for them to flower. So I had to reschedule things. It's like, okay, well, I had to now go earlier, right? Like, and now I had to go in April, and now I had to go in March to find the plants in flower. May was an occurrence in the past about 40 years ago. Now I had to rethink when I'm planning my trips because of that. We have had completely failed trips, like nothing was in flower because of that. We passed it. And how is it changing your sense of urgency around your job or how you think about your job? Uh, my research in particular, I've started to pivot to, to take my research questions to make it more apl applicable. Um, so I'm starting to collaborate a lot more with restoration ecologists and restoration ecologists here at the garden and also on the ground um, in, in our countries of research. Um, so now we're, we're, be, we're actually able to utilize a lot of our research questions and think creatively about how we can build more resilient ecosystems um, through restoration um, and, and manual introductions of, of of plants, so. For, for useful plants, the sorts of uh, plants that we especially focus on in the Himalaya, um, one of the, the places we're trying to sort of study and understand and intervene is sort of this intersection of plants that are threatened both by the effects of climate change, um, but, but also by harvest. And maybe it was harvested in the past was sustainable of a plant that's particularly important as a medicine or for local people to sell and be part of their livelihoods. Um, uh, but now, with climate change effects, um, may, may not be sustainable. So one of the things we've done is uh, worked with local doctors to suggest alternative plants for plants of conservation concern that are still culturally acceptable, um, but uh, not, not as threatened by um, uh, over-harvest and climate change. Um, other things we've done is actually really do the work and study and understand plants to better inform um, management uh, policy within countries. So um, uh, Mukti Paujela, a student that I um, helped to supervise in Nepal, just published a very cool paper where he showed that for one of these important Himalayan herbs, uh, actually a, a limited amount of harvest at certain elevations, so certain climates, um, can actually help increase the amount of the herb that's there. So that helps inform um, policy that's not just a one-size-fits-all conservation policy, but that really um, uh, sort of supports local livelihoods as well as biodiversity. Devin, I might have a couple of pictures of like um, human impact on forests that we see a lot. Like, we tend to go to the same places over and over just to study them really well. And throughout the years, we are seeing the forest is, is no longer there is getting is shrinking and um, we can see the uh, small mining companies just like cutting everything down and just trying to find minerals or we see these huge trucks of logs of trees just going by on the highway where we knew the forest was there three years ago because we were there. So um, sometimes the, the local countries need our expertise in telling them this, this forest that you are that is taking down is really important. It has a lot of resources that you can utilize sustainably. And if you preserve it in the long run, it will be better off for everybody, right? So, but it's, it's kind of sometimes depressing just to be in the field and see that you're trying to race against the trees falling down. And you're like, well, now what I'm gonna do? And I actually published a paper, and it wasn't, it wasn't in Latin America, but it was in, um, in, the, in the Asia, uh, about typhoon, the impact of typhoons on islands. So typhoons are just getting stronger and more frequent. And there was a population of a palm that we discovered, and the next year there was a typhoon, it was completely gone. So that was the last, the first and last time that we saw that species. So it's pretty sad, but it also makes us, it makes us think like we have to go to these places. We have to figure out what is there before it's gone. And we have to tell somebody, we have to tell the government, we have to tell local communities why it's important to preserve it as well. And that's really challenging. That yes. must be frustrating, but what are the things that give you hope? And could you talk about some of the successes that you all have had in conservation? I, 
I'm looking at Nisa because uh, one of the things, so I've recently become introduced beyond uh, my Asia research to um, uh, some of the facets of our program in Madagascar. And that's a program that really, like, honestly does. Every time I visit, it gives me hope to see the expertise of the um, the Missouri Botanical Garden staff that, that work there, um, the Malagasy staff. Um, the on-the-ground conservation they do, the integration of that conservation with scientific discovery in a place that where there are new species and species from nowhere else in the world being discovered all the time by, by our researchers, by, by people affiliated with St. Louis and Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, and, um, and also active restoration going on of trying to restore degraded landscapes as well. Um, uh, do you find this feel the same way? <laughs> <laughs> the, the work, yeah, I mean, just to, to reiterate what, what Robbie said, the work that our team in the country of Madagascar is doing on the ground is pretty phenomenal. And they've engaged hundreds of people on the ground, community members, to buy into the idea that if you restore a landscape, not only is it in better for the environment, but it's better for your livelihoods, too. Um, and we've done this at, at over 12 conservation sites, but then we're also extending our network um, into, into communities all over where we do botanical ex exploration. Um, and that is solely the work of our Malagasy staff on the ground, and so that's pretty incredible. Um, and they're saving, literally saving species from um, extinction by going out collecting from populations and bringing them back to nurseries that local community members manage to grow out these trees and then replant them out um, back onto the landscape. I agree those are like the best way of managing the greenhouses like the communities know how to manage these, these things like if we, if we send the plant here to San Luis we had to figure out from zero like what kind of soil does it need what, how much temperature how much light our horticulture department does a wonderful job of figuring it out but the local people already know all that so they just apply it right away whereas here we're just trying to figure it out still like they know it they get those greenhouses growing all the time we have a, a community greenhouse network in Colombia right now that is working on the frailejones, which are endemic plants of the paramos, the high elevation vegetations in the Andes. And that project is just fascinating. They engage every single community around the national park to bring frailejones and cultivate them and then reintroduce them in the areas that have been degraded. I love that project. And so soon we're going to be doing a Q&A, so if you have questions, go ahead and think of those. We're going to start passing around a microphone. But before that final question, could I hear from each of you either your favorite thing about being in the field or your favorite story, a story that you tell at a party, for example, about your travels? So Monica, I think we should start with you on that one. <laughs> okay. So my favorite anecdote while I was in the field is actually in one of those tables. We discover a new species of the group of plants that I work with while we were in Ecuador with Tom Croat. He's another expert of that family here at the garden. It was his collection number 100,000. That means he has collected over his 50 years here at the garden 100,000 different plant specimens. He's the collector alive with the highest number of collections. I was in that trip. We discovered that species. And then when we pressed the plant and put it in the herbarium, it became the six million specimen of the garden, of the herbarium. Right now, we are at seven million. So we're growing. We are, we are not sitting there and, OK, yeah, we made it to six million. We are still growing exponentially. My name is in the, in the label. It's a new species. It's a highlight for the career of my mentor, of Tom, a highlight for the garden. Thing. That is just like, I take that specimen with me everywhere. <laughs> and it's so portable. It's so tiny, it right? <laughs> well, that, that's it. So the picture of the plant itself is huge. It's like the size of Tom, which is like, I don't know, super tall. Um, is one of the pieces. So we actually ended up doing like nine different pieces of herbarium cardboard to be able to press the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa? Um, so my story isn't exactly about plants, but um, so I was at a field site in South Africa. I was at a, a preserve, and the land manager there um, he, um, ensured me that I would not come across any wild cats, even though they were found in the preserve. They were more scared. Um, of me than I was of them, and there was lots of other big game in this preserve. 
Um, and this was a little bit later in my trip in South Africa, so I was feeling a little bit more confident about the fact that I could come across wild animals at any moment. Um, and so I was out at, at dusk um, because the baobabs flower in the evening. Um, so I was assessing sort of what tree I was going to set up in for the evening to lay my line and climb up into the tree to observe pollinators. Um, so I get to a tree and I lay my line and I'm, um, I'm sitting in the tree and all of a sudden I realize, gosh, there's this funny like odor and it's not baobab flowers. They have not opened yet. I'm like, what is that? And I do have a photograph if Desmond is able to pull it up quickly. Um, but I, so I start sort of looking all around me and I suddenly realize I am surrounded by a family of giraffes. <laughs> <laughs> so they are all around me. Um, and I think I had to sit there for three hours before they slowly worked their way um, and I could remove myself and move on at this point. So. One quick follow-up, what does a giraffe smell like? <laughs> um, it was just gamey. Like you knew there were, like, there were animals. There were animals. Yeah. <laughs> Robbie? Um. I'm not really a storyteller, but I think my favorite thing really is, um, although it's really hard to, to climb mountains at elevation when you're already above 4,000 meters, to say, I'm going to climb up there to 5,000 meters. Um, but like to be able to do the hard work and sort of have done all this planning we've talked about already, um, have everything worked out, have a good team of collaborators who you trust and you know already, and to know that you're doing it for a good reason and kind of, kind of put all of that aside and just focus on like climbing up the mountain is a really enjoyable part of field work. Great, okay, now we're gonna open it up to your questions. So if you have a question, also, Kate in the back yes. has a microphone, so go ahead and raise your hand, or if you want to get up, you can do that too. I'm, I'm headed to the front. Great. Okay, well, but everyone else wants to hear you, so give us a second. Everyone else wants to hear you, so let's do a microphone. I have to, I have to be the radio advocate here. We want to hear your lovely voice. <laughs> so I know you talk about collecting your specimens and pressing them. Um, but is there anything else you're trying to bring home as well? Seeds or, you know, information that's just beyond the name, the look, the shape? What is it that you're really trying to find out and bring home? So I, I work a lot with DNA, with um, the genes that make up the plants. So Robbie was talking about the samples in silica gel, like the little desiccant that you find in your shoes when you buy new shoes. I get a lot of those. I collect the floral scents as well, just little tubes like this big, sometimes in liquid, sometimes not, just the pretty tight tubes with a little sample in there. Um, I, don't, I usually don't bring seeds. Seeds are a little bit more tricky to transport. Um, for tropical plants, they don't travel very well, especially through the x-ray machines of the airport. I've had a lot of collaborators trying to bring seeds legally with permits and everything, and as, long as, as soon as they get through the x-ray machine in the airports, they're toasted. They don't grow anymore. So, yeah, so those are, are very tricky. I just, I just gave up on those. Like, I know if I'm going through an airport, it's not, they're not going to survive. I do bring a lot of seeds. Uh, maybe baobabs are very difficult to germinate, and so they, act, they actually need scarification. Maybe it helps. I don't know. But um, so I bring back a lot of seeds for, um, for different types of germination studies. So for studying um, chromosome numbers, you actually have to grow out the seedling um, and utilize root tips. Um, and I also do some studies related to understanding gene flow on the landscape. So uh, if you have a pollinator, where are they moving to, like uh, in, a, in a population? And so you need a lot of seeds from the, parent, um, the, the mother tree to understand sort of how genes are moving across the landscape. Um, and so that requires um, a lot of seeds. But I have gotten mm -hmm. into some challenges with um, government agencies bringing, bringing seeds back. Um, um, there's certain requirements, so it's a lot of permitting, as Monica said, for seed, uh, and it has to be hand carried. And I was traveling out of, I think it was, it was either Tanzania or South Africa, but the airline would not let me bring all of these specimens with me. And I was like, I have to hand carry, I have to hand carry. So they made me check it, 
I get to the US, I show up at border protection, they had lost my luggage. Mm -hmm. And so I explained to customs what happened, I showed them my permits, I said I don't have the specimens, they're shipping it, they're gonna ship it directly to Customs and Border Protection at the time. Um, so I go back, I'm a graduate student, I'm back at, at the university. Next thing I know, a investigator from Department of Homeland Security comes to the university to investigate me because I did not follow protocol. Um, it was fine in the end, but I was terrified. <laughs> For, for us, um, a lot of uh, data on, on what plants are growing and how many of them there are. Um, photographs and GPS points to try to, so that we can try to refine our plots in seven to 10 years when we return. Um, and hundreds of thousands of uh, temperature recordings collected by our little temperature loggers that we leave there for uh, five, seven, 10 years and are taking hourly temperature readings. Hi, um, thanks so much for all these great presentations, <laughs> really informative. I was just wondering if part of your preparation is also a medical preparation, such as taking lots of different shots, and I was thinking, have you ever had a major emergency? How do you deal with medical emergencies? I'm saying, you know, when you're far, far away, I'm sure you don't have you know, cell phone that you can just pick up and, and get somebody to the spot. I mean, and hopefully you haven't had a major emergency or, or um, you know, broken leg or something, you know, falling out of a tree or something like that. But I just wondered, you know, how you dealt with it. Thank you. Definitely lots of shots. Like um, in Latin America, we're known for having every single tropical disease that you can think of transmitted by mosquitoes. So once again, you have to prepare for that. And there was one, one time that they told us like the place where you're going has right now a, mal a malaria outbreak. So there is uh, medicine that you can take, quin quinine pills that you can take before you go there. So you're kind of like a little bit protected. And if you get beaten by the mosquitoes, which you will, you will have to take more. Um, there was one kid while we were there, like of the community that died of malaria while we were there doing field work. So that was that was a, like a shock for us. It's like, oh wow. Um, we have had people that have um, had malaria in like the African tropics, which is also very common. And they come to Latin America and they're like, oh, I'm protected. I already got it. I got it once. I'm not going to get it again. And they get it. It's a different strand of malaria, the one in Africa and the one in Latin America. So you had to figure out your, your mosquitoes and your viruses and all of that. Definitely lots of shots, yes. And I have my little vaccination cards for all the years that I have to get them, yeah. I've been fortunate I haven't had any major issues. I did get a pretty bad case of like Giardia once in Madagascar and I was weeks away from treatment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but I've been pretty, pretty fortunate. Um, but yes, carrying back up medical supplies. Um, I also have type one diabetes, which is extra planning. So I have like a whole bag with just um, backup equipment. So that's like a significant part of my luggage actually. And in addition to all of this, we, you know, we also plan for emergency evacuations, helicopters if necessary. Really the big problem always is not being in a particularly unsafe place, it's just that we're really remote and it's hard to get to, uh, to medical support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned, um, or several of you mentioned, going to various uh, plots, at, you know, periodically. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, at a, even at a high level, what, are you, what changes are you seeing? I know there's climate change and things, but what are, what are you seeing? What's, what's happening to the diversity? Are, are things going like, you know, you would expect if things are getting warmer? So, you know, th you know, things that might be lower in altitude, you know, are now thriving higher, you know, and vice versa. You know, what, what insights are you getting, you know, at, at a high level? I mean, it's, 
there's whole papers out on this, I'm sure, but. Yeah, that, that's a beautiful encapsulation of the talk I was preparing. So that, you, you, you said it, <laughs> yeah. essentially. Um, that, so our, our mountain plots that we do, I didn't give a lot of detail, but we have summits at different elevations. Um, so we have a snapshot of what's kind of growing just above tree line, um, what's growing in mid-alpine, and what's growing at the highest limit of plant life at each of our sites. Um, and then we can see how that changes. And yes, we are seeing the first signs of plants beginning to move um, up, up in elevation, of lower elevation plants moving up into this area where we often have unique endemic species that aren't found anywhere else, that are limited only to the alpine. Um, and that's something that's shared with people who do the same methodology that we do at different mountain sites around the world. We're all seeing a pretty similar um, general pattern. Uh, one thing that's interesting and unique with our Himalayan sites is that at the highest elevation sites, we're seeing as temperatures get a little bit warmer in the short term, um, more plants, more green, and a lot of these plants are, are these endemic alpine plants that sort of they've had a pressure released and are able to uh, fill in with a few more species. Um, but we still have the pressure of the lower elevation species moving up from the lowest elevations and this kind of shrinking islands basically of, of alpine diversity. And you were talking about um, sometimes it's not climate change, it's differences because of humans, right? Is that another thing to add? Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of changes. Well, it's, it's actually become um, some interesting research questions with collaborators in continental Africa of how landscape changes have influenced um, the different um, po pollinators different visitation rates of different organisms that, that visit our plants of interest. We've seen a shift in pollinators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, thank you for sharing your stories and the impactful work that you're doing. And uh, I have two quick questions. One is, that, could you speak to the, uh, the funding aspect of your research projects, like the sources and the process? And also, uh, how, how can the public especially you know, the garden members getting involved in some of the ongoing or future projects. Thank you. So uh, by and large, uh, a great, great majority of our uh, science and conservation work is funded by competitive grant writing. So a big part of all of our jobs here, and one thing that I, for some reason I don't think we've mentioned, of, of all of this preparation and collaboration building and saying like, oh, this is the perfect place that I really want to go to, is trying to convince um, a, a, a foundation, um, a, a government funder, or another funder that we really have the scientific credentials, we have the permits, and we have the right collaborators to go out and do it and do it responsibly. Um, and so um, we manage a great deal of that rotating short-term grant funding um, and uh, really have to rely on that for, for most of our work. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let other people add answers to that. I think you. Any addition to that? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we write a lot of grants. If we want to go places, we have to find the money to go to places. So um, there are uh, foundations that concentrate on certain areas, geographical areas. So we target those if that's where you want to go. Um, and there are other foundations or there are other organizations like the National Science Foundation. We get grants from them that are um, to do research anywhere in the world. Uh, there's, those are very, very competitive. They, there is only like a 10% um, approval rate. So out of 300, proposals that people send in, only three of them get, get funded. So it is challenging, but we, we definitely have a, um, a lot of different kinds of grants that we can um, apply to. Um, we've been very lucky that we have been supported for several years because of, like Robbie said, we have the credentials. We have proof that we do this and we do it right. And we, we have, um, made the connections with the funding agencies that, that prove it, yeah. And how you Uganda members can be involved, your memberships are super important. Your memberships are definitely like the working machine of the garden, right? If you guys are not members, if we do not have members, we will not be sitting here. Um, of course, there are different 
uh, activities, different kinds of tours that you can get involved with. Sometimes there are trips to the field with one of our researchers. Sometimes are tours of our collections, so you are more engaged in what we do. Sometimes it's just uh, bringing your kids to the garden and have them take one of our classes in our education department, come to our sustainability festivals, come to our open houses. Uh, we do this we love, like I, I, I'm part of the education co coordinator, so uh, I love showing everybody what I do. So that's, that's part of it. I, I love seeing your faces here. And this is what we want from members. We want, to, we want the members to hear what we do and to support us with your memberships. I think the, I, yeah, I think it's a really good point that the overall support of the garden as an institution from members uh, really allows us in the science and conservation division to, to exist. And we have to rely on competitive grants to do each individual project, but just to exist as a, as a, a body of, of people. And it's really rare. There aren't a lot of botanical gardens that have the sort of science and conservation impact that, you know, our, our colleagues and 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 we have uh, usually there are very small science and conservation staff, if any, um, and so it's really a special feature of of, of Missouri Botanical Garden um, itself. This uh, this work that we do. Well, as membership director, I can't think of a better way to end that program than with a thank you to you all, but specifically also to our panelists and to Kate, our fantastic moderator tonight. Um, these guys will be outside if you have a little time. If you didn't see their tables before you arrive, please stop by. We also have some additional members of our science and conservation team. And as always, thank you for coming, but how about a round of applause for the great conversation tonight?